was a fine house we had tonight, Adolf. Let's hope it keeps up all season. You're right, Max. I'm glad to know that there are people who still like good music instead of that boop de boop and hot shot business we hear every place. <laughs> that sounds like you've got a radio in the house. I have. And children, too. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, dear. Must you play that radio so loud? Uh, okay, okay. Every time you come in, I've got to turn the radio off. If you wanted it just for an ornament, you could have saved yourself some money and bought a hat rack. Now, such a way to talk. Doesn't your father like to see you enjoy yourself? Always. Huh. Music is good for everyone. But for the love of sake. Such discords as you listen to, here, here is real music. Uh. Hello? Who? Oh, just a minute, please. All right. Telephone. Don't be so impatient, darling. I thought only taxis had meters. It's never too late for champagne and orchids. Okay, darling. Paula, it is almost midnight. I don't like you should go out so late. Any time is the right time for a good time. You've got your slippers, your violins, and your symphony records. Why should I stick around? Listen, Paula, it is you and Richard that I come home for. And when I get here, you both go out. Don't you like your home? Well, it's all right for those who go for firesides. Personally, I don't. It's just a difference of opinion. It's what makes the world go round, you know. When I was your age, I spent my evenings practicing my music. But you and Richard, you only care for a good time. Oh, well, it depends on what you're looking for. And a life with a violin under one's chin isn't my weakness. Oh, I almost forgot. Leave ten dollars on the desk for some things I ordered downtown today. They'll be delivered in the morning. Uh, what time are you coming home, Paula? When the party's over. Nice, pleasant little family this is. Not. You think she'd include me on some of her parties? But no. <laughs> Her friends are too swell to have anything to do with a guy that wears clothes like mine. For the love of sake. Now, such talk is silliness. I buy you good clothes. Huh? Only last Christmas, I bought you a new dinner suit. Yeah. Mine, I've got already nine years. And it's still good. Mm -hmm. Only in the pants. Nobody notices that when I'm sitting down. Oh, nobody looks at what a musician wears anyway. Little supper, just you and I. Eh? Uh, uh, you go get it. I'm tired. All right, I'll get it. Richard, you should have seen the crowd at our concert tonight. We played Offenbachs, Offies, and Hades. That's my favorite overture, you know. The boys all want to see the go-to Taronis with them. But not Adolf. Not when he can come home and be with his boy. Richard. Richard.
Вечер. Well, how did you like your last guest conductor? Hmm? Ah, he's like all the Russian maestros. Just a contortionist. And besides, he favored the hobos. <laughs> <laughs> Rosini is hard to please. Buhakov is a splendid conductor. We played Orpheus and Hades beautifully. You are always faithful to that overture, aren't you, Adolf? And while we are on the subject, Buhakov told me that your violin passages were exceptionally fine. Well, it is my favorite. Perhaps someday I will be able to play it good enough to play the solo passages. Adolf, that opportunity will be yours two weeks from tonight. Mancini, you mean that... Yes, I mean we will repeat the Orpheus in Hades overture and you shall be the soloist. As orchestra manager, I have already arranged with the symphony board of directors to have you promoted to the concertmaster's chair by this time. You see, Martinelli, our present concertmaster, leaves to go on tour, and the place is yours. You don't know what this means to me. <laughs> All my life, I have waited for this moment in my career. Adolf, a fine musician like you deserves such a recognition. And now to your rehearsal. The director is waiting. Congratulations, Adolf, as our new concertmaster. Thank you, Max. Oh, I'm so happy. And I'm nervous, too. You know, I only played the overture, Orpheus and Hades, for ten years. I need more practice, maybe. Eh? Why don't you go down to hear Franz Steinmann tonight at the music hall? Watching him should give you more confidence. That's just what I'll do. Listening to the greatest violinist in the world should be enough inspiration. I just say so. Badly hurt in an accident. Oh, yeah? Well, then maybe we can collect damages. No. It happened in a public street outside the stage entrance of the music hall. You see, there was a big crowd, and they all wanted to get close to that great violinist, Steinman. The people was very rough, and I was pushed through a window. Richard, it hurts pretty bad. Well, it's your own fault. Why don't you come home instead of hanging around with those crazy musicians? Hey. You won't be able to play now, will you? Well, not for a little while, but... Don't you worry. Everything will be all right. Do me a favor, Richard. Get me a little schnapps. I feel a little dizzy. Oh. Uh. Yeah. Thank you. Ah, this is terrible. Say, so suppose you lose your job and are kind of being laid up. How are we going to live? For the love of sake. That seems to bother you quite a lot, doesn't it? Look in the desk and get me my bank statement. You read me the balance. Why, it's only $52. What? Oh, yes, I remember. I had $500. I bought a new violin. And I loaned Rodzinski, a cello player who's out of work, $50. A fine lot of consideration you have for Paul and me. Here you are almost penniless because you must buy violins and help out hand musicians. Now your hand is injured and you can't go to work and yet you see everything's going to be all right? Sure. Why not? Even if I'm laid up longer than I think, surely you and Paula can help out by going to work. Yeah, what kind of work? Paula ain't the type and I can't find anything that suits me. 
And it's your fault, too. You never let me go out and do what I wanted to. I always had to stay home and listen to that crazy music of yours. Well, if you're going to talk like that, I think I'll go to bed. Tell Paula I want to see her when she comes in. Telegram for you. Sign here. Thanks. Pennsylvania, six, five, six hundred. Uh, get me Pennsylvania, six, five, six hundred. Uh, what time can I get a train to Atlantic City at night? Eleven forty. Thanks. My Paula, gone. And Richard, too. Well, Mr. Green, this is the final bandage. Yeah. Now we shall see how you have mended the past two weeks. And then the fingers. Tell me, what's the matter? Quick! Exercise will probably limber them to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. Your fingers will always be semi-paralyzed. Mm -hmm. The tendons have tightened as they heal. No, this can't be, Doctor. I will have circulation in them and then by tomorrow night maybe to be all right. Eh? Then I can play my solo. Your disappointment will only be more intense if I cover it with false hopes. You will never play well again, if at all. I know how you feel, Mr. Grieg. 
but you must try to overcome your grief. Your health won't permit such despondency. Isn't there someone who can help you, a friend, or your family? Family? I have a family, yes. But they're away now. I'll be all right. I'm not so sure about that. You really shouldn't be left alone. Well, I'll manage somehow. You see, Doctor, I'm not alone. I still have my music. You heard the concert? Yes. It was good. But between us, I would have given anything in the world if you had been the soloist chair where you belong. Yes. Ah, man, see me. You would say that just to make me feel good. Because you're my friend. Well, it was good to listen. That's all I can do now. You have been with us for years. To see you uh, leaving now is like losing the melody of a fine overture. Your hand is permanently injured? Well, that's what the doctor said. But look. Look at the fingers. See? They move a little. Maybe with a little practice. Eh? Wait. I'll show you. I want to remember your playing as it was, not as it is now. Forgive me. I had to try. And now, I want to ask you a favor. Anything in my power, Adolf. I know I can't play anymore. But isn't there something else I could do? As the manager? You do the hiring. Perhaps I could help arrange the scores. Take charge of the library. Anything you wish to give me. I wonder why we always must disappoint our friends when they need us. You ask me something, I would give you in a second, if I could. But Adolf, I can't. There are no vacancies. I cannot throw men deliberately out of work, even if I wanted to. Perhaps later we'll find a place. Yes. Perhaps I'll find something else. I'm uh, sure you can, just on your reputation. And in the meantime, um, no, no, no. won't you accept this, just as a loan from the orchestra and myself? No, no Mancini, I appreciate that, but I couldn't. No. I'm not worried. My family, you know, they won't let me want for anything. Uh, Adolf, your face is as beautiful as your music. Don't ever lose either. My music is my faith. Part of some nice paper, Adolf. Uh, the society column. That holds no news for me. Me neither. Uh, Thanks. Good night. Good night.
Marie, haven't I told you to keep him away from the piano? That noise will drive anyone mad. I'm sorry, ma'am, but he doesn't want anything but music. Well, put him to bed immediately. Keep him away from anything musical. Yes, I know what I'm talking about. Where's the baby? I thought I heard him drumming on the piano. You did. I sent him to bed. The noise is enough to drive anybody crazy. To bed? Wait. You mean to say you sent Carl off without letting me say goodnight to him? What? He's not old enough to understand you anyway. But you are. Paula, you're about as selfish and shallow as anyone could be. That isn't the opinion you expressed when I was unavailable. Naturally. I only knew a false charm, a less intimate side of you then. At that time, you still had a husband to acquire. That's merely a crude way of boasting about yourself. Candidly, I may be as disappointed as you are. I'm young and you're, well, uninteresting. I see no reason for showing a charm and happiness I don't feel. Are you going to the concert this evening? Yes, worse luck. It's too late to stop the clocks from calling for us now. Well, at any rate, their presence will guarantee a pleasant evening. Yes. I talked to him at lunch at the club today. Seems that Mrs. Clark is thinking of filing suit for divorce. <laughs> I've never seen him in such high spirits before. Hey, Mazzini, you come to my house tonight, eh? And my daughter Carmen will have on the first two on the table will make the mouth glad to walk. <laughs> <laughs> not tonight, Rossini. I'm too tired. Oh, tired. You come to my house, you're not going to be tired. Because you know why? You always have plenty good fun, and you are... Oh, look, poor man. He's a musician, too. Excuse me, mister. Dio mio, it's a hater. Good heavens. It is Adolf. Oh, help him up, poor man. Mancini. Rosini. Oh, it is good to see you. Adolf. Why? You are shaking. I changed my mind. Both Adolf and I will accept your invitation for supper tonight. Good. No, 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 no. I must go. Oh, nothing of the sort. We haven't seen you in years. What? You would refuse Rosini? Why is there a union for everybody? Come, we go. We go. E quando Romito Ah, Carmen. Yes, Daddy. More vino, eh? Presto, presto. Adolf, where are you living? Up down. Way up down. Why don't you move down here with us? 
All you get uptown is the noise of the streetcars and peddlers. Down here we have nothing but music, except when your friend plays the saxophone upstairs. He says the same thing about your trombone playing. <laughs> How would you like to stay down here with Rossini tonight? You look very tired, Adolf. And tomorrow we could spend the day together with our music, eh? Sure, why you no sleep down here tonight? I got plenty room. Come on, I show you. Well, I am a little tired. And if I can stay here, I think I'll go to bed now. Huh? Good night, Adolf. And we we'll see you tomorrow. Sure, we we'll see him tomorrow. You know, I wear the night shirts. You'll find them in the drawer. They're better than pajamas. More room and no buttons. <laughs> Good night, Adolf. Good night. <laughs> you know something? I don't think he's got home. Never do I. I've heard that he played on the street for coins and often came to stand before the concert hall. But until tonight, I never was able to find him after the concert. Poor fellow. His music and memory made him come there, and then his pride would make him leave before we could see him. How awful. Daddy, I've often heard you say what a fine musician he is. Can't we do something to help him? My dear girl, he's very proud. He would be insulted if we give him charity. And you know, he can't make music with his bad hand. If we only could think of a business proposition for him. I have it. Listen. Second studio below us here? Yeah, downstairs. Oh, why not set him up as a violin teacher? He wouldn't have to play much himself, and I'm sure we could find some pupils. Two of the children daddy teaches the trombone to. It's an idea. Oh, it's great. Practically perfect. I am sure he would accept it if he thought he would pay us back. You know, as a business proposition, not as a charity. I go to donate a frock coat and three music stands. I'll hang his drapes and make his coffee. And I sponsor him personally. We start tomorrow to the Greek music school. To the Greek music school. Ah, it's too wrong. The kitchen to come. It's too wrong. Shh, it's too wrong. The kitchen. It's too wrong. The kitchen. Come on, the kitchen. Come on, the kitchen. Come on, the kitchen. Come on, the kitchen. Young man, you will never learn to play the violin by looking out the window. Oh, gee. Only sissies play violins anyway. I want to play the drum. Then why do you come to me twice a week? Because my mother went and got this violin for a lot of soap wrappers she'd saved up. What the reason for becoming a musician? All right, that's all for today. Thanks, Mr. Green. But remember, I want to hear improvement by next Monday. Oh, I'll practice hard, Mr. Green. Goodbye. Yeah. Bye. Well, you know, look where I'm going, eh? Uh, excuse me. Your pupil seems anxious to leave. Uh, what a life with those children. Their mind seems only on the clock. Ah, you've only had eight years of it. Think of the lifetime I have suffered with those kids, and their heads are full of applesauce. Mm. With the movies and the radio, they have no time for real work. Yeah, how many pupils you have now? Two dozen. I had one more, but he's now in reform school. Say, how do you get your pupils to practice? Mine pay no attention to me. You see, the trombone is a grand horn. And the harder you blow, the louder she is. <laughs> So I say to my pupils, you know, as all children love a noise, blow hard, because someone will hear and say, there's a musician, he can't miss. <laughs> you know, they practice so much, they go deaf from their own noise. <laughs> so is everybody else. <laughs> when you give lessons, it sounds like a boiler factory. Oh, is that so? You don't think that Rosini is a great musician, eh? No. Well, I tell you something. Once I sailed to South America for a concert tour, uh -huh. and a big fog come at sea, who do you think saved the ship? Who? I don't know. Who? Me, Rosini. The captain, he come to me personal. He says, Rosini, go on the bridge 
and play your trombone till the fog she go away. Could a violin be so tremendous? No. But a foghorn could. Well, of course it... <laughs> I laugh too. <laughs> Uh, say, where is your father? Arguing with Adolf, I guess. Left their chief exercise. Ah, <laughs> uh, that Adolf, he's a great old fellow. You know, he's forgotten more about music than most people will ever know. Yes, sir. I've grown very fond of him, for many reasons. Uh, it uh, wouldn't be because he lets us meet in the studio, would it? Maybe. You'd better go upstairs before father comes in for lunch. Uh, uh, what do you give me if I go? Kitty? Oh, or spaghetti? Say, that's a swell title for a song. But uh, I'll try it out first now. Huh? Come on. I want you to put the B on that husband of yours. I'm in a spot. Aren't we all, dear brother? I'm having troubles of my own. I just read an ad in the paper. Adolf Grieg, professor of violin and cello. 232 Christopher Street. Why not go and see father? He seems to be doing well, and you always were his fair-haired boy. Carl. Yes, Mother? We won't need your services any longer. You may go. Matter, mother. Professor Heinrich's a good teacher. Your father allows you to have these teachers, but he doesn't have to stay here and listen to them. I'm sorry. I thought everybody liked music. You're your grandfather all over again. My grandfather? Well, what do you mean? And why haven't I ever seen him? It's impolite to ask questions. And Carl, I want you to forget all about music. It reminds me of something that I myself want to forget. Do you understand? Yes. Yes, mother. Excuse me for being so long at the telephone. Now we begin the lesson. Today we play Rubenstein's Melody in F. I'll show you how it goes. No chewing gum, please. Not the fly specs. Now you listen to Rosine. Today we're going to play Rubenstein's melody in half. Sam, I wish we could write a good number. Something new. Yeah, something new. Now we commence. One, two, three.
meaning of this? Get out of here, you overstuffed scallion! Get out! Faster, I can be closer! Get out of here! Boy, what a melody! And to think the old boys downstairs started it. Say, wait here. I'm going down and uh, compliment Rosina. That'll be all for today. Thank you for loaning me a violin, Professor. Mine will be fixed in time for the next lesson. Well, that's nice. Oh. Goodbye. Goodbye. Bye, Professor Peach. Goodbye. Bye. Bye. Maybe he's in the bedroom. Mr. Gray, yes. you have company. What is it? Herb and I have had dinner. So I thought you'd like some nice hot minutes, Johnny. Soup? I can yeah. eat soup any time. What's the matter here? You look kind of tired. Well, my pupils were very trying today. I try to teach them classic and they want to play jazz. It seems nobody likes the old music anymore. What did you run into? Oh, uh, another music teacher who shares your sentiments. Yeah? Only uh, he hits you with a trombone to prove it. <laughs> <laughs> Where is he? Daddy's cooling off at the concert hall. Rosini went to the council hall. I haven't been there in ten years. You've been awfully good to Carmen and me. Just like a... a father. I'm glad. Because once I had children of my own. And you two sort of take their place. I didn't know that. Are they... Are they... Dead? To me, yes. Never you mind. We'll try to take their place. Even after we're married and have children of our own. Eh, Carmen? I'm afraid Father will see that that dream never comes true. Nonsense. Once I was as narrow-minded as he is. But now I think different. And so will he. Youth is a rhythm the old ones can keep a tempo to. The old melodies are the memories of our youth. That is why your father and I persist in teaching them, even though they're as musty as we are. Ah, now, now I know you don't mean that. Why, most of our modern music is based on the old classics. Say, uh, what is your favorite composition, Mr. Griggs? Offenbach. Orpheus and Hades. You know it? Oh, I sure do. Gee, I wish you could play it for me. I can. And the photograph. Oh. <laughs> I haven't played that symphony for a long time. Stop it.
Hello, Pop. Richard, come in. Come in. Well, nice little layout you got here. My, my, it's been a long time since I've seen you. Uh-huh. Where have you been? It'd be easy to tell you where I haven't been. Uh, are you in business? Well, uh, right now I'm looking over the field. I'm uh, uh, sort of a promoter. Promoter? Yeah. I develop angles. Work out little money-making details. You don't say, I knew you'd make good someday. <laughs> <laughs> Sit down here and tell your father all about it. Tell me, what are you promotioning? Well, I got something big coming up. Yeah? I saw your music school ad in the paper. Thought I'd sort of drop around and use your place for an address. <laughs> you know, a man like me needs a good, respectable setup. True. Besides, you and I should see more of each other than we have. You are right. Well, you know, my boy, my home is always yours. Eight years I've had this music school. I haven't made much money, but it's a living, and you can share it as long as you like. <laughs> well, we're going to get along just fine. <laughs> I tell you, I got a big deal on in Chicago. Yes? Yeah? Yes, yeah, tied up most of my capital for a while. You don't say. I was wondering if uh, you could lend me a little money for a while. I want to go uptown tomorrow and look over the field. Of course. Is that enough? Sure. I'll let you know if I need any more. That's all right. Now, I'll tell you what, you sit here, and I'll make some Liederkran sandwiches and get some beer, and then we'll have a nice little talk, eh? <laughs> <laughs> You know, I was just thinking, the last time we were going to have beer and sandwiches, you didn't wait for them. Well, don't worry, Pop. I might be ten years late for that date. But I'll wait this time. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning, Richard. Oh, hello, Pop. Good morning, Miss Rosini. How's the most beautiful daughter of the world's finest trombonist? I'm glad you appreciate my father's ability, Mr. Grigg. Oh, excuse me. While I read my mail. I can't understand why Richard gets so much mail. Perhaps they're from admirers. What? Nothing. Richard makes a lot of money, doesn't he? Well, he doesn't tell me much. He has an office uptown where he promotes things. He's a smart boy, Carmen. I'm glad you're proud of him. You deserve a lot of happiness. Here comes one of my pupils. Good morning, Professor. Good morning, Sidney. I'll leave you two to the mysteries of the violin. <laughs> Come in, Sidney. Well, Sidney, did you practice hard this week? Uh, no, sir, I didn't. Uh, you see, sir, my dog ate half the music, so I could only play the bottom of the page. <laughs> well, that's the first time I ever heard that one. Never mind, the lesson will commence. Mr. Richard Grieg. Well, uh, I'm his father. What is it you wish? We're friends of his. We'd like to see him privately. Yes? Yeah? Come in. Thank Come you. inside. You run along, Sidney. Come back the same time tomorrow. I always like to meet my son's friends. He's a fine boy. Yes. And clever, too. Yes. Uh, is your son in partnership here with you? Oh, no. He's been away a long time. Just came back a few months ago. I just have a little music business here. Too small to interest him. He has an office of town. 
He's a big promoter. I'll say he is. Where is he, anyway? Yeah, just a minute. Richard! Richard! Yeah, yeah. Now, come on here, convention. You know, these gentlemen are friends of yours. Oh, yeah? Yes. That's news to me. What's on your mind, boys? We read that ad you mailed to people, and we thought we'd like to get a piece of your business. We're violin manufacturers. I don't need any violins. I have plenty of them. You got violins, Richard? Well, I thought you didn't like music. Mind your own business. I'm sorry, gentlemen. I'm not interested in anything you have to offer. No. Maybe you will be when we get you down the pen. Why, Richard, what does all this mean? You guys are crazy. You're the guy that's crazy, using the mail to defraud. Well, there must be some mistake. Why, what has Richard done? You ought to know. Why, he sent letters to mailing lists and has received money for services and merchandise which your music school was to deliver. Now, we hold a warrant for his arrest and enough complaints to put him on ice for years. And for all we know, you're as guilty as he is. Ah, lay off. My old man's got nothing to do with it. He's just a musician, but he's not in on my swan song. Oh, Richard, what? Ah, oh, play it on your violin. Well, what are you waiting for? I'm the guy you want, ain't I? Yeah, come on. Well, you... All right, Pop. We're not pinching you. It's funny a nice old guy like you would have a son like that. Well, those are the breaks. So long. Your morning paper, sir. Oh, thank you. Oh, what's this? Richard Grigg, brother-in-law of Michael Rupert, prominent manufacturer, was yesterday arrested by federal authorities on a charge of using the mails to defraud in a get-rich-quick scheme. Well, that just about breaks the camel's back. I'm sorry, can I help what my brother does? What's the matter, Daddy? Carl, will you leave the room, please? I want to talk to your mother. Yes, sir. Excuse me, Mother. But it has made me reach a decision that has long been in my mind. I want a separation. Suppose I don't want a separation. I think you will when I tell you a financial settlement goes with it. Hmm. Change might do me good at that. Perhaps your ideas are the same as mine. What's your proposition? I keep Carl. You get fifty thousand dollars cash. You don't value our Sunday highly. Make it a hundred thousand. Seventy-five, then. And remember, you are to stay away from both of us. That won't be difficult. You've been an uncongenial wife and a disinterested mother for years. Save your compliments. Is this final? My lawyer will draw up the paper immediately. You get the cash. I keep Carl. Mary, I'm going away on an extended business trip. I'm leaving him completely in your care. Be good to him now and give him lots of those cookies you know you used to give me when I was a boy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, don't you worry. Your old nurse knew how to make a good man out of you. <laughs> Carl and I, we will get along fine together, won't we, Carl? Yes, Mary. <laughs> but gee, Dad, I wish you didn't have to go away. Well, I feel the same way, son. But after all, it's business. I'll write you off. And mind, mind you behave. Yes, sir. <laughs> now then, you run along because I want to talk to Mary. Yes, those cookies we just talked about. It's in the kitchen on the left shelf. Go ahead. Goodbye, Dad. Goodbye, son. I may be gone quite some time, Mary. That's why I've closed my house and moved Carl down here with you. Mary, I want you to be a mother to him. Of course, you know that my wife and I have separated. That's why he needs a good woman's care more than ever. You understand? He will be a good company for an old woman like me. Don't worry about anything. God bless you. Thank you, Mary. Goodbye. Goodbye. A young man. I know all about your father, but I don't know nothing about you. Now tell me. Tell me everything. Well, first, I like these cookies a lot. Oh, <laughs> that's a good beginning. And I think I like living down here. Mm -hmm. It's old and funny looking. <laughs> Just like what next? 
I'm 10 going on 11. I like music. And I can play both the violin and the piano. Oh, that's fine. Music is good for everybody. Do you play well? My music teacher said I played very well. But my mother always made me stop. because she said it was just noise. So, when we attend to that, tomorrow we will get a new music master. And we will find out for sure. And I know a fine one, just for the violin. Gee, really? <laughs> I think I like you an awful lot. <laughs> How are you? Good morning, Mary. I found your message under my door. Do you have a new pupil for me? Yes, and a fine one. That's good. I want you to meet him. Carl! Carl! Come here. Yes. Carl, this is your new music master. Professor Green. Professor, this is your new pupil, Carl Rupert. How do you do, sir? Now, how do you do, Carl? So, you want to become a violinist, huh? Yes, sir. Well, have you had lessons before? Oh, yes, sir. Many of them. Uh -huh. And I practiced all the time. That is, when I was allowed to. Well, that's fine. Now, suppose you play me something before we begin the lesson, huh? Yes, sir. Go ahead. I play, sir. Play something you know real well. Your favorite. Like it, sir? It's my favorite. Carl, you played it beautifully. My boy, you have the feeling and ability to become a great musician. And maybe someday old Adolf will make you famous. But it means work. Hard work. Adolf has been exclaiming over your ability. Now that I have heard you, I agree with him. My boy, you are very good. <laughs> My old friend, you cannot know how I hope for Carl's success. In the two years he has been with me, I have grown to love him. Not alone for his genius, but for his young companionship. And for his devotion to myself and my music. I understand. Perhaps he gives you something you missed all your life, Adolf. I feel that fate almost gave him to me. As the image of what I was once. What I dreamt my own son might have been. 
Will you help me get Angie's future? Of course. We'll start his career with a salon recital at the Hotel Savoy next Monday. Mr. Rossini, just think of me giving a concert. Yes, too bad. What? Too bad you wasted all your talents on the violin. Fortissimo, how he could have played the trombone. <laughs> That boy has a world of talent. You are absolutely right. His technique is superb. Old Adolf Grieg deserves all the credit for training him. Uh, chairman of the Symphony Society, I'm going to recommend that we have that boy appear as soloist on one of your future concert programs. I thought you wanted Carl. What a future of fame and wealth that lad can count on. Oh, here he comes now with Adolf. Darling. Paula. Paula. And father, well, what a reunion. What did he call you? Well, he called me mother. Carl's your grandson. Professor Grigg is my grandfather? Gosh, if I had my choice, you're just the one I'd pick. Carl. Carl. Well, I can hardly believe it. For two years, day after day, I have been with my own grandson and didn't even know it. It isn't fair. You can blame Michael for that. He stole Carl from me and put him with an old nurse. Well, I didn't know where he was. I haven't seen him until now. Carl, darling. My daughter, my grandson, all in one day. It is almost too much for an old man like me. Congratulations to both, getting a grandfather and a great music teacher. Now that I know your relationship, I understand where your genius comes from. Oh, Mancini. I just told Mr. Mancini to engage you as soloist for a coming concert of the Cosmopolitan Symphony Orchestra. Congratulations. Oh, thank you, sir. Pardon us. Mr. Rogers and I will go now and arrange all the details. Oh, uh oh. -uh. Uh -uh. Did you hear what they said? I'm so happy, Grandpa. Now I know I did everything you asked and studied so hard. Um, I'm you, I guess. Yes. Carl, you're not going to play that concert. You're coming home with Mother. And then we're going to Europe where you can have the best training before you make public appearances. But Mother... Paula, oh, you can't do this. Remember, he's mine too. He's my grandson. My prodigy. I heard them say what Carl's future will be. And he will not appear until he's been schooled by the best masters. Too many careers have been ruined by hate. After all, I have as much interest in his success as you have, you know. Come along, Carl. You can see your grandfather later. Please, Paula. Don't take Carl away from me. You'll see him again before we leave for Europe. Come on, Carl. Come on, dear. Sorry, I'm late, Paula. Shall we grab a cocktail?
It's all a terrible mess, particularly for poor Adolf. Yes. She tried to take Carl to Europe, but the husband stopped her. Well, what if her husband does win Carl? Adolf still loses. The papers say the father disapproves of a musical career for the boy. It's useless to think that Carl will play now. I have already engaged a substitute artist. Well, it's certainly a rotten break for old Adolf. He's always helping other people, and yet every wish he has is a disappointment. It's true. Only yesterday he argued father into letting us become engaged. You can't tell me anything about him. He never struck a false note in all his life. The judge will announce his verdict today in his chambers. There's nothing we can do. After careful consideration of the testimony and argument of counsel presented in the case of Paula Rupert versus Michael Rupert, regarding the custody of their son, one Carl Rupert, aged 12, the defendant alleges and by documentary proof establishes that the plaintiff accepted a financial settlement in return for relinquishing the rights to the son's custody. The plaintiff, in turn, states this agreement is not a legal binder and that her son needs her love and protection because of the father's desertion of the boy to the cares of a professional nurse. I am possibly going to be guilty of setting a precedent in judicial procedure by taking the course I have decided upon. Young man, please come forward. Now, I'm going to ask you a most serious question. Consider it carefully, for your answer shall be the court's decision. The state gives you the privilege of choosing either of your parents or a suitable substitute as your legal custodian and guardian. What is your answer? Why, I choose my grandfather, Adolf Grigg. But this is ridiculous. I should appeal as revisions. Gentlemen, gentlemen, gentlemen. Please. Mr. Grigg, do you accept the appointment of this court as the custodian of your grandson? Or have you any objections? Objections? Your Honor, I rejoice in the greatest gift an old man could possibly get the devotion of his grandson. Please, Your Honor, would you excuse me now? I must practice my music because tonight I play with my grandfather's old symphony orchestra. You are both dismissed. <laughs> <laughs> you see, Mary? He's going to play the concert after all. Yes, I'm going to get the dinner ready. No, 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 no dinner. He plays better on an empty stomach. No, he yes, yes. Eat. That's all right. Yes. I have longed to do what you are going to do. The opportunity was denied me. Now you have a chance. Show them what we can do. All right, Grandpa. <laughs> 